In the southern highlands of New South Wales in August 1841, the weather was chilly and bracing. It wasn't raining, but it was cold. 61-year-old ex-convict John Mulligan's family were huddled together with a friend, John Lynch, and Lynch had brought some rum for them all to drink. As the night grew long, John suggested that he'd go out to cut down a bunch of wood for the fire if the young 18-year-old Johnny would come and help him wheel them in. John agreed, and the two men left the hut. <coughs> Johnny agreed, and the two men left the hut, and Lynch began hacking at the wood with his axe. As he finished, he took the opportunity to swing his axe backhanded and struck young Johnny on the back of his head, killing him instantly. Lynch threw some bushes over the body and returned to the hut, telling everyone that young Johnny had taken Lynch's horses out to the paddock. Some time passed, and young Johnny did not return. His mother, Bridget, went to the front door. coo No response. She grew suspicious. At this time, her husband, John, returned from the fields, and he asked what was happening. Bridget told him that young Johnny had disappeared, and told him to fire his gun into the air and warn him. Lynch said if Mulligan fired his gun, it would bring the police, and John was known for fencing stolen goods. John Mulligan still went to get his gun, and Lynch retrieved his axe from his cart. Bridget walked around the back of the hut towards where young Johnny's body was, and Lynch realised that he'd soon be caught. So Lynch took his moment and walked behind 61-year-old John Mulligan, striking him down with the axe. He went down like a sack of potatoes. He then went to find Bridget, who had started to scream. She'd found young Johnny's body. She ran past Lynch in order to raise the alarm, and Lynch tripped her with his foot. And as she fell, he hit her also with the axe, and she was also killed immediately. He then returned to the hut where 13-year-old Mary was, now brandishing a knife from the kitchen and trembling in fear from what she'd seen. Lynch gave her 10 minutes to pray for her soul, and as she put down the knife to do so, he grabbed her, violently raped her multiple times, and then battered her with the axe, bringing this night's murderous rampage to an end. Let's take a stab at this. Hi mates, and welcome to Something About Murder. I'm Jay Something, and every week we present, for your satisfaction, two episodes in true crime from here in Australia. If that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty boomstick, and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure you also punch the notification bell in the face, so that every time we release a new video, you can get notified. Our videos are also available in audio form on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whichever podcast platform is your favourite. Situated in the southern highlands of New South Wales, about an hour and a half's drive from Sydney, lies the town of Berrimah. Its population now is around 1,500 people, but back in the 19th century, it was closer to 300. It's a sleepy, historic town, with many places to visit, including arts and crafts shops, a museum, the old courthouse, or Australia's oldest hotel, the Surveyor General Inn, which was built in 1834. In the heart of the town is the Berrimah Jail. Now, the Berrimah Jail is now known as a minimum security prison. It's the last place that prisoners go before they rejoin society. But back in the day, Berrimah was a rugged little village. It was well known for being a good stopping point for travellers in the cold southern highland region. And because of this, the Berrimah Jail was always full. And in the 1840s, it was the setting for the execution of Australia's first serial killer. A diminutive but solidly built man of just 5 foot 3 with a rugged complexion and brown hair, John Lynch was born in about 1812 in County Carvin, Ireland, in an area between Baileyborough and Killincare. He was the son of Catholic Owen Lynch and his unnamed mother, a Protestant. His mother died when he was young. His father was a well-known criminal in the area, and it didn't take long for the apples to fall from the tree. When John was 19, his older brother Patrick was tried and convicted in July 1831 for sheep stealing and sentenced to transportation for life. Patrick was transported to Sydney aboard the Captain Cook, arriving in April 1832. John and his 55-year-old father were both tried and convicted later that year, in October 1831. John was convicted of obtaining goods under false pretenses, for which he received a life sentence. His father, a widower aged 55 years, was convicted of having stolen goods in possession, receiving a sentence of transportation for seven years. 
John and his father were both transported to the colony of New South Wales aboard the Dunvegan Castle too which departed from Dublin on the 1st of July 1832 and arrived in Sydney on October 16th. Upon their arrival, John Lynch, recorded as a ploughman, was assigned to James Atkinson at Albury Farm in the Bong Bong district near Berrimah. His father, Owen Lynch, was assigned to Richard Brownlow, a publican of Sydney. John never saw his father again as Owen died on the 26th of February 1834 in the jail hospital at Sydney at the age of 58. In 1834, James Atkinson died, and his friend George Barton became the overseer of Albury Farm, marrying James's widow, Charlotte Atkinson, in early 1836. Charlotte is considered by many to be the first children's author in Australian history. In February 1836, George was stopped on a road by a bushranger gang, who robbed him, tied him to a fence, and whipped him. It was suspected that the perpetrators were a gang of bushrangers operating in the area, led by John Watt. In mid-February 1836, Watt was captured, along with another gang member, Timothy Pickering, after a shootout with the police on the Cowpasture River, during which a third gang member was killed. In early May, Watt and Pickering were tried for an armed robbery, committed previous to their apprehension, found guilty, and sentenced to hang, which they were, eight days later. On Friday, the 12th of August, 1836, two of George Barton's assigned convicts, John Lynch and John Williamson, were tried in the Sydney Supreme Court before Justice Burton for the willful murder of Thomas Smythe, another of Barton's assigned servants. Smythe had been murdered on the 4th of March, 1836. His body was discovered after several days in the hollow of a fallen tree, about a mile from the convict huts at Albury Farm. Two heavy pieces of wood, clotted with blood and human hair, were found nearby. Barton's overseer, Mr Humphrey, gave evidence that prior to his murder, Smythe had been held in the Bong Bong Watch House in order to be examined by the district magistrates on a charge of having lost or stolen a saddle and bridle belonging to his master. Humphrey had turned up at several court dates in order to prosecute the case, but on each occasion the magistrates failed to attend, after which it was decided to release Smythe in consideration of the punishment he'd already undergone and the inconvenience to the Albury farm. Smythe returned to his hut after his release and was found to be missing the next morning, with his body being discovered several days later. The case against Lynch and Williamson rested primarily on the testimony of Michael Hoy, another convict at Albury Farm, who lived in the same hut as Smythe, Lynch and Williamson. Hoy claimed that Lynch and Williamson had lured Smythe from the hut on the evening of his disappearance. Hoy maintained the motive for the murder was a suspicion that Smythe had provided information that Lynch was one of those involved in the previous robbery and assault of Barton, and that's why Smythe was released. After the discovery of Smythe's body, Hoy said that he'd had a conversation with Lynch in the presence of Williamson when Lynch was supposed to have said that Barton had come to the knowledge that Lynch was one of the men that assisted Watts to flog him about three months before, which he could not have done if Smythe had not told him something about it and therefore he was glad he had put him out of the way. When Hoy was cross-examined by the prisoners, it was said that as a consequence of some dealing in cattle between Hoy and Smythe, Hoy himself might have had reason to murder Smythe. At the very least, Hoy's testimony was significantly discredited. George Barton was also called to the stand, but his evidence was rejected because he was pissed. As well as dismissing his evidence, Justice Burton fined Barton £50 for coming into the witness box in a drunken state. In summing up, the judge explained to the jury that, with the absence of corroborative evidence, the case rested solely on the credibility of the witness Hoy, which he considered to be a person tainted with crime and therefore liable to suspicion. The jury returned a verdict of not guilty for both men. At the conclusion of the trial, the Crown solicitor claimed that other charges were pending and Lynch and Williamson were remanded until further information could be filed against them. Both men were sent to Hyde Park Barracks to be disposed of there, with the Attorney General suggesting they should be sent to the Bong Bong Magistrates Court to be dealt with summarily for certain acts of misconduct. John Lynch was in irons for a long time in different areas. In 1839, he was working on a convict stockade gang in Newcastle. On the night of the 27th of June, 1839, John received a stab wound after being attacked, he claimed, by three other inmates of his hut. He said he was attacked by Thomas Barry, Thomas Bolson and Charles Wilson in retribution for a complaint he had made that the three men were making straw hats and bartering them to the stockade cook in exchange for extra rations. Lynch maintained he was sleeping when the three covered his head with a blanket and Bolson and Wilson held him while Barry stabbed him in the chest and side. 
Barry, Bolson and Wilson were convicted in August 1839 in the Supreme Court in Sydney and sentenced to death. In September 1839, these sentences were commuted to transportation to a penal settlement in Van Diemen's Land. Sometime after serving seven years of this sentence, which was recorded as life, Lynch claimed to have applied at Hyde Park Barracks for his freedom. He was kept for about a fortnight without getting any satisfactory answer, and then he left and returned back to the Berrima district. However, the most likely explanation for Lynch's reappearance in the Berrima district is that he escaped from captivity. John Lynch returned to the Berrima district in about July 1841. He firstly rode to John Mulligan's farm at Wombat Brush, southwest of Berrima, about 10 miles along the old Goulburn Road. He had a long relationship with Mulligan, an emancipated convict who had previously acted as a fence when Lynch had committed robberies in the district. A fence is someone who knowingly buys stolen goods in order to later resell them for profit. Lynch hoped to obtain his share of the proceeds of the property that he previously left with Mulligan, though his former associate was not forthcoming. In fact, Mulligan was prepared to pay only about a quarter of what Lynch was asking. A bitter argument ensued, and Lynch stormed off, swearing revenge. He went to the Albury farm, where he had once worked for the owner, and stole an eight bullet team and drove them off. He'd broken them himself, and later said that he'd taken them because he wanted to start out again, honest. He intended on taking the bullets to Sydney and selling them. It didn't take long for Lynch to forget about his honest new start and lapse back into his thieving ways. At Razorback Mountain, about 80 kilometres from Sydney, he met a man named Edmund Ireland and started travelling with him. Ireland was travelling with a First Nations boy. Together they were driving a full bullock team and its load of wheat, bacon and other produce to Sydney in the delivery for its owner Thomas Cowper, who was unknown to Lynch. Ireland took quite a liking to the diminutive Irishman, and when they pulled up for the night, he prepared him dinner and finished off the evening with one of Ireland's cigars. All the while, Lynch was plotting how to murder Ireland and his young helper, and make off with their wares. It seemed to him that he would get more money by killing Ireland, taking possession of his cart and its load of produce, than to drive the bullocks to Sydney. Lynch later said that it was at this time that he lay awake beneath the Southern Cross. He consulted God and sought his approval for what he was about to do. Lynch didn't make it clear whether or not God actually gave his blessing for the forthcoming massacre, but seeing as he had at least consulted God in the first place, he said this was as good as getting the go-ahead from the big man, and uh, the big man would look after him. The following morning, Lynch asked the boy to help him round up his bullocks, and the boy was only too happy to oblige. As the boy walked ahead in the scrub and well away from the camp, Lynch crept up behind him, and with a tomahawk he produced from inside his jacket, smashed the boy in the back of his head. One hit, and the boy fell. Dead. Lynch returned to the camp to find Ireland preparing breakfast, and rather than murder the unsuspecting farmhand immediately, he explained that the boy had run off looking for the bullocks, and that they should eat without him. When breakfast was cooked and Ireland was about to serve it up, Lynch distracted his attention by pointing to the scrub. Ireland turned his back to look, and Lynch cracked his head open with the tomahawk. As the man lay dead at his feet, Lynch wolfed down a hearty meal before dragging both bodies to a space between two rocks and covering them with brush and stones and whatever else he could find. John pointed the stolen team of bullocks and the dray, which is another word for a cart, in the direction of Berrima and set them loose. He anticipated that someone would round them up and return them to the Oldbury farm and nothing would ever come of it. He then took possession of Ireland's team with the farm produce. With the good lord looking over his shoulder, Lynch could see no hurry in continuing his journey and remained at the camp for two more days. On the second day, he was joined by two men named Lag and Lee who were in charge of a team of horses. Lynch said that he thoroughly enjoyed the company of the two men and they ate, drank and sang songs until well into the night. The men even performed an Irish jig for Lynch's entertainment. And it was for these reasons that Lynch didn't attack them uh, with his tomahawk and steal their possessions during the night. The following morning, unaware of their narrow escape from death, Lag and Lee invited Lynch to travel behind them for company, an offer which he readily accepted. As they approached Liverpool, on the outskirts of southern Sydney, Lynch said that he nearly died of shock when a man cantered his horse alongside him and the dray and asked him what he was doing driving his team. It was Thomas Cowper, the owner of the rig for which Lynch had murdered Ireland and the boy. As quick as a flash, Lynch smiled at the man and replied, I'm glad I've seen you. I was just wondering whether I'd knock into you. 
The fact is that your man Island was taken ill back there and begged me to take the load to Sydney for you. He said I'd probably meet you somewhere along the way. Lynch explained that he'd left the boy to look after Ireland overnight at the camp and that they were probably slowly making their way back home. Cowper expressed his gratitude to Lynch for having taken the load of perishables on ahead towards Sydney. Thomas Cowper's gratitude deepened when Lynch was only too happy to continue to Sydney with the dray and its load while Cowper went back to search for Ireland. Silently thanking the Lord for looking after him through the close shave, Lynch arranged to meet Cowper in Sydney in a few days' time and then he drove the bullocks on ahead until he caught up with Lag and Lee. The men parted company at the junction of Liverpool Road and Dogtrap Road as Lag and Lee turned in the opposite direction and headed towards Parramatta. Now that he was no longer travelling in tandem, Lynch made good progress, and by driving all day and night, he reached Sydney two days before his scheduled time to meet Cowper. He realised that he had no time to lose, as Cowper would come looking for him when he could not locate his missing employees, and most likely call the troopers. Lynch got a drunk to sell the produce so that he could not be incriminated at a later date, and if questioned by police, he could stick to his story about Ireland being taken ill and the produce being stolen from the back of the dray while it was unattended. After pocketing the cash from the sale of the farm produce, Lynch headed south out of town along the Illawarra Road towards the Berrimer Road. Once again, he was presented with yet another incident that astonished him, which further convinced him that the good Lord was on his side. As Lynch neared the Georges River, he saw Chief Constable McAllister of Campbelltown, and, fearing he'd recognise him, Lynch turned into a cross track, leading towards the Berrimer Road. Later, Lynch said that this close shave frightened the living daylights out of him, and he decided that he would get rid of Cowper's team at the first opportunity, as it could only eventually get him into trouble. As Lynch approached Razorback Mountain, where he'd killed Ireland and the boy, he met the Frasers, a hard-working father and son pair who were making their way towards Berrimer in a team owned by a Mr. Borton. Lynch took an immediate fancy to the team, and from the minute he was in the Frasers' company, he was plotting their deaths and the disposal of Cowper's team. He would claim the Frasers' team as his own, and he travelled with the Frasers to a campsite at the Bargo Brush, where two married couples were already camped. They all had supper, and Lynch crawled under his cart to sleep. No sooner had he got there than he saw a trooper ride into the camp. He asked Fraser if he'd seen the dray that Lynch had stolen from Cowper, and the older Fraser shook his head and said he didn't know nothing about it. The trooper didn't see Lynch under the dray, and much to John's surprise, he took off. Lynch said that his escape was nothing short of a miracle, and if the Kappa Dre had been painted bright pink, it couldn't have stood out any more. But, even though it was under the trooper's nose, he didn't notice it. Lynch was lucky to be concealed beneath it when the trooper arrived. It was almost too good to be true. Yet again, the big guy had intervened and saved Lynch from apprehension. He believed that he was invincible, and he could go on killing as he desired. Lynch claimed to have then consulted with the Lord, who told him that in the light of his narrow escape, the Frasers had to be killed, and Lynch must take possession of their team. As part of his murderous plan, during the night, Lynch set his Bullock team free, and in the morning, he and the Frasers woke to find that the Bullocks had scattered far and wide. He told the Frasers that his team appeared to have strayed, and they'd have to go home and fetch another one. Meanwhile, he asked the Frasers to help him better hide the cart. The unsuspecting Frasers were only too happy to assist John Lynch, unwittingly, in his scheme to murder and rob them. Lynch later said that after the three men had hidden the cart, he helped them hitch their horses to their cart and they drove out of Bargo Brush. They agreed to let John travel as near as possible to the place where he had told them he lived. With the incriminating Cowper team and cart successfully disposed of, Lynch relaxed and concocted his plan to murder the kindly father and son, and with God to guide him, he figured it wouldn't be too hard. They travelled until dusk, where they reached Cordo Flat and made a camp for the night. In the morning, the young Fraser and Lynch went in search of the horses. Lynch put on his coat to hide the tomahawk and let the youngster go ahead. Then, when they were in the bush, Lynch crept up behind him and hit him with one blow. The boy died instantly and Lynch hid the body beneath some wood and returned to the camp with one horse. Mr. Fraser inquired as to the whereabouts of his son and Lynch told him that he was looking for the other horse. Fraser became angry at this point, but not because he suspected Lynch killed the boy, but because the horses had never strayed before. Lynch distracted Fraser by pointing to what he said was his son in the bushes, and when the man turned to look, he hit him with a massive knock on the back of the head with his axe, and Fraser dropped like a log of wood. After thanking the Lord for his assistance in murdering the father and son, 
Lynch dragged their bodies into the bush and buried them in a shallow bush grave. He hitched their team of horses to the cart and headed towards the Mulligan farm to settle an old score. As he rode up to the farmhouse, he saw Mrs Mulligan sitting in a rocking chair on the porch. She asked where he got the horses and cart, and he replied that they belonged to a man in Sydney. Lynch asked after her husband and son and daughter, and Mrs Mulligan told him that they were in the fields, working. What do you want? she asked. The 30 pounds your husband owes me, he replied. What 30 pounds? Miss Mulligan asked. Lynch retorted, you know very well what. For the articles which I got from burglaries and highway robberies, which I did at the risk of my life, and which your old man was supposed to be fencing for me. Mrs Mulligan told him there was only nine pounds in the house. This gave Lynch the impression that she was fobbing him off until she could talk to her husband. He decided to wait until her husband returned and give him the chance to pay, and if he refused, then Lynch would see to it that he would get to meet the Almighty. Lynch then walked to the Black Horse Hotel at Barrima and bought some rum, thinking that it would get Mulligan in the right frame of mind to pay him the money. On his return, he saw Mr. and Mrs. Mulligan together on the veranda, and they greeted him in a friendly manner. Mrs. Mulligan fetched glasses for the rum, and they sat on the veranda drinking and chatting. Lynch eventually brought up the matter of the £30, to which Mr. Mulligan asked him to be reasonable about the amount. Lynch then left the veranda and sat brooding on a log nearby, deep in consultation with the Lord about what he was going to do next. According to Lynch, the Lord gave his blessing to murder them. After Mr. Mulligan had returned to the fields and Mrs. Mulligan had disappeared back into the house, Lynch lured their young son Johnny into the woods on the pretext of cutting some wood for his mother. Once out of sight, Lynch killed the boy with a single blow from his axe to the back of his skull, covered the body with brush and returned to the farmhouse. Where's Johnny? Mrs. Mulligan inquired. Gone to the paddock with the horses, Lynch said. Lynch knew then and there that Mrs. Mulligan suspected he'd murdered her son, and she became hysterical and told Lynch to fire his gun to attract attention. What's all the urgency, he asked. He's all right, I only saw him a few minutes ago. But the woman insisted that Lynch shoot his gun to indicate to anyone within earshot that all was not well. But if I do, it will alert the police, Lynch said, as Mr. Mulligan approached and asked what was going on. They were both suspicious of Lynch's actions now, and in fright, Mrs. Mulligan disappeared back into the house, while her husband headed towards the woods in search of his missing son. He didn't get far. Lynch ran up behind him and, with one swing of the axe, felled him to the ground, stone dead. After dragging his body into the woods, he saw Mrs. Mulligan coming towards him, and as she ran into the woods, he tripped her up and killed her with another blow to the head from his axe. Lynch knew that the Mulligan's 13-year-old daughter was in the house. As he entered, he saw her standing in the kitchen in terror, having seen at least one of the murders committed. She was standing behind a table holding a butcher's knife, sobbing with fear and trembling violently. Lynch hadn't been prepared for this, and he just kind of stood there staring at her. And then he yelled, put that knife down! But she didn't move. Lynch told her again to put the knife down. Lynch then ordered her to get down on her knees and pray as she only had 10 minutes to live. Lynch then took the terrified young girl into the bedroom and raped her repeatedly. He then brought her back out into the kitchen and tried to comfort her, saying that life was full of trouble and that she'd be better off dead. Lynch then pointed out the window and, as she turned away, he struck her with the axe and she fell dead without a sound. Lynch then assembled the Mulligan family's bodies in the bush and set them alight atop a huge pyre of branches and logs, saying later that they burned like bags of fat. From then on, Lynch focused on getting rid of the Mulligan's possessions and taking over the farm as his own. Every personal item and all of the deceased family's clothes were burned. Lynch then locked the door of the hut and travelled to Sydney, where he called at the office of the Sydney Gazette newspaper and paid for a notice in the name of John Mulligan that was published on September 9th. This stated that Mrs Mulligan had left the family home without her husband's consent and that John Mulligan wouldn't be responsible for her debts, giving the impression that the Mulligans had broken up and it would come as no surprise that under these circumstances, the farm would have been sold. Next, Lynch, again under the name of John Mulligan, wrote to all of his creditors, telling them that he had sold the farm to a John Dunleavy for £700 and Dunleavy had taken responsibility for any outstanding debts. He forged a deed of assignment stating that John Mulligan had signed over the farm and all of its effects to John Levy repeating the story that Mulligan had left the farm at Wombat Brush and obtained a transfer of the lease into his name, but at an increased rental. 
With all in order, Lynch became overseer of the farm, and considering that he was very well known throughout the district, he moved about freely, without anyone being in the least bit suspicious about the name change to John Dunleavy. Lynch probably couldn't be blamed for thinking that God was truly looking after him. Lynch next proceeded to Appen, where he engaged Terence Barnett and his wife Catherine to work as labourer and housekeeper, and brought them to the farm at Wombat Brush. The Barnetts had previously known Lynch under his real name, but were told to refer to him as Dunleavy. Lynch claimed in his later notes that his reason for engaging these people was that he knew them to be great simpletons, and that he would be perfectly safe with them. After Lynch's return, a man named Gordon, who resided near Mulligan's Wombat Brush Farm, went to the Mulligan's house and was greeted by Catherine Barnett. The housekeeper then went outside and yelled for John, upon which John Lynch came from a large fire in the neighbourhood. Gordon was surprised, expecting to see young Johnny Mulligan, and inquired of his whereabouts. Lynch replied that the young man was in some trouble at Goulburn, and that the others had gone up there to see about it. This satisfied Gordon, who then left. The bodies of the four Mulligans that he had murdered still hadn't been discovered, and no one seemed to be looking too hard for them. And so for the next six months, Lynch lived a charmed existence. John Dunleavy was a good farmer, who was loved by his staff and trusted by his creditors, and was, from all accounts, a gentle and considerate human being. John Lynch was a dog. He preferred being Dunleavy. Sometime later, Lynch, or John Dunleavy, travelled to Sydney in a horse and cart on business. On his return, he met Cairns Landrigan, aged 27, along the road in the vicinity of the Razorback Ranch. Landrigan had begun living at Berrima in the service of an innkeeper, and a few days previously had left to go to Picton to visit his brother Patrick, an assigned convict. Lynch offered to engage Landrigan for £14 for six months to do fencing on the Wombat Brush Farm, which Landrigan accepted, and the two travelled together towards Berrima. As they passed Crisp's Inn, Landrigan hid himself and explained to Lynch that Crisp had summoned the Irishman for stealing a bundle of clothes from him, and he didn't want to be seen. As a result, Lynch regretted having hired him and determined to get rid of him. It was reported that Landrigan, described as a sober man, quiet, and of saving habits, had £40 in cash to his possession when he had left Berrima to visit his brother. After they had dinner together at the Woolpack Inn, which was witnessed by all of the staff and numerous patrons, Lynch drove Landrigan to the Ironside Bridge, where they set up camp for the night. As Landrigan sat on a log, chuckling away to himself at a joke that Lynch had told him, Lynch snuck up behind the unfortunate man and cracked him over the back of the skull with his tomahawk. But the huge Irishman didn't die with the first blow. He just rolled to the ground unconscious, with the smile still all over his face. It took a couple more blows to smash in the back of his skull and kill him. Lynch dragged the body into the nearby bush, covered it with vegetation, and proceeded to his farm at Wombat Brush, intending to return later to bury the body. Had Landrigan's body not been found, it's feasible that Lynch's divine luck might have held, and the killings would have gone on. But, in any case, the following morning, George Sturgis, a labourer for Hugh Tunney, was driving bullocks back from a creek when he discovered Landrigan's body, covered with broken bushes and being eaten by dingoes. The Berrima police were notified, who attended the scene. Landrigan had several severe wounds to his head and was dressed in only a shirt, with his temperance medal attached to a string around his neck. The body was brought to Berrima, where it was identified as Landrigan by the publican, John Chalker. Chalker provided information about a man named Dunleavy who had stopped at his inn north of Berrima in company with the deceased. The two had taken dinner at Chalker's Woodpack Inn the night before the murder. Chalker and Landrigan had become friendly and discussed Landrigan's new job. Afterwards, the two proceeded towards Berrima in a horse and cart. As a result of this, Noah Chapman, Chief Constable of Berrima, Sergeant Freer and John Chalker went to the old Mulligan farm to arrest Dunleavy. They found him repairing a roof and immediately restrained him. The constable noticed a bloodstain on the shirt he was wearing, and Dunleavy explained it away as the result of an insect bite. The sergeant noticed a cart and, examining it, found that its track width matched that of the cart that had been at the murder scene. It even had the stuck wheel from the tracks. The clincher was a hat they found in the bedroom of the house. Chalker was able to identify it by a tear in the band as the one that Landrigan had been wearing when he stopped at the public house. Dunleavy was taken into custody, and questions began to be raised about the Mulligan family, previous occupants of the farm, who were supposed to have suddenly left, and uh, never being heard of since. 
Constable Chapman later returned to the farm with Landrigan's brother, who identified a belt found there as belonging to the deceased. A search of the residence revealed stolen property. Kearns Landrigan was buried on the 24th of February 1842 at the All Saints Anglican Church at Sutton Forest. With other irrefutable evidence gathered by police, on the 21st of February 1842, Lynch's identity was fully established and he was formally indicted for the murder of Kearns Landrigan. At the time of his arrest, John Lynch was described as standing 5 foot 3 inches tall, very small, dark whiskers, and rather good looking. Furthermore, he was suspected of murdering Edmund Ireland and the First Nations boy, with three men having sworn they had seen him driving Cowper's team in the vicinity of Razorback. He was also being examined on suspicion of murdering the Frasers. Inquiries were also underway regarding the fate of John Mulligan and his family. But even in the light of the overwhelming evidence against him, Lynch steadfastly maintained his innocence in the belief that he would be exonerated and freed. Mulligan's neighbour, Gordon, reported his meeting with Lynch, who had been attending a fire at the Wombat Brush Farm. The police magistrate and several policemen attended the location of the fire, pointed out by Gordon. After digging up a considerable quantity of potatoes, they found several human bones and the tooth of a young female. When Lynch was informed of the discovery, he replied that no one could swear that they were Mulligan's bones, or even that they were the bones of a white man. On the 11th of March 1842, Lynch underwent an examination at the Berrimer Police Office on a charge of being implicated in the murders of Ireland, the First Nations boy, servants of Thomas Cowper. Cowper swore that a double-barreled gun found in Lynch's possession was his property. One of Cowper's men also identified a velveteen coat and a waistcoat as being the same as those worn by Ireland. Cowper at first could not swear the prisoner was the same man that he had met driving his team at the Liverpool Road, but later, as Lynch passed him, he recognised him as the same man. He explained that when he first met him, the man had stood sideways to him, but on seeing his side face as he was proceeding to the jail, he instantly recognised him. This prompted a long tirade of abuse by Lynch directed at Cowper. Lynch was then remanded in custody. On the 21st of March 1842, Lynch appeared before the Chief Justice of New South Wales, Sir James Dowling, at Berrimer Courthouse. The court heard that Lynch had narrowly escaped the gallows in 1835 when, as an active bushranger, he had been incriminated in a murder committed in the district but, miraculously, had come out of it unscathed. From the outset, Lynch, addressing the judge, expressed a hope that his honour would allow him to have a full and fair trial as there had been a general prejudice created against him by the numerous crimes laid to his charge. Dowling replied that the respectability of the jury was ample security that Lynch would have justice done. A range of witnesses gave evidence in a trial that lasted only 12 hours, during which the court was crowded, with many who attended having travelled upwards of 30 miles. It was reported that a considerable number of females were present during the whole day. Lynch cross-examined most of the witnesses, endeavouring to cast doubt on their testimony. It was reported that Lynch questioned the witnesses with a degree of ability far beyond the expectations of those who saw him. At 10 o'clock in the evening, after retiring for a few minutes, the jury returned a verdict of guilty against Lynch. After the verdict was handed down, the court heard that Lynch was also incriminated in the murder disappearances of at least another eight people in the district with whom he was seen, or known to have been associated, at the time they went missing. Two days after the trial, on Wednesday the 23rd of March 1842, the court assembled for the sentencing of the prisoner, John Lynch. Justice Dowling put on his black cap and addressed Lynch. John Lynch, the trade in blood which has so long marked your career, is at last terminated, not by any sense of remorse or the sating of any appetite for slaughter on your part, but by the energy of a few zealous spirits, roused into activity by the frightful picture of atrocity which the last tragic passage of your worthless life exhibits. It is now credibly believed, if not actually ascertained, that no less than eight other individuals have fallen by your hands. How many more have been violently ushered into the next world remains undiscovered, save it in the dark pages of your memory. At length, you now have fallen into toils from which you cannot escape. John Lynch stood unmoved in the dock, a smirk of defiant indifference on his face as the judge announced, you are sentenced to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. Not even the harsh words from the judge and the death sentence could dampen the optimistic Lynch's belief that he would be reprieved and eventually set free. Lynch steadfastly clung to the story that he was innocent, but it was to no avail, and only after every avenue of appeal was exhausted 
on the eve of his execution, did he confess to his crimes. In his confession, Lynch said that he believed that he had gone about his robbing and killing under the watchful eye of God and with his divine approval. John Lynch called the Reverend Mr. Summer and police magistrates to his cell to witness his full confession, including the murder of Thomas Smythe and to concocting the stabbing upon himself by three other convicts. Extensive details of his confession were published. This confession rocked the fledgling colony, New South Wales, to its foundations and ensured John Lynch's place in the annals of Australian crime forever. John Lynch was executed by hanging on the temporary gallows at the back of the new jail at Berrimah on Friday morning, 22nd of April, 1842. With the gruesome tally of nine victims, he is considered to be Australia's first and most prolific individual serial killer. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you watching the whole video. Join me next time as we trawl through another episode in the true crime history of Australia. If you've enjoyed this video, once again, please go ahead and shoot the like button with your trusty broomstick and stab that subscribe button until it bleeds. Make sure that you also punch the notification bell in the face so you can get notified every time we release a new video. And remember, all of our episodes are released at the same time on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm also on Instagram, at something about murder, and I respond to every message I receive. So I look forward to hearing from you, and I hope you don't get murdered. Stay safe out there.